All right. It is so great to see everybody and so wonderful to be with you here today. Um, again, my name is Adrian Griffin. I'm the Executive Director of Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. And today we'll be talking about maternal mental health policies and programs in the United States. And we at MMHLA have been talking with Sarah about doing this presentation for probably about six months, um, wanting to bring sort of a focus on maternal mental health for all of you who are working in the maternal mortality space um, to just raise this up as a particular issue that impacts new uh, parents. And first of all, congratulations to all of you for um, being one of those states that has received funding from the federal government as part of the state innovation program. So thank you for all the work that you do and thank you for being with us here today. I know just what everybody needs, another webinar, right? So I'll try to make this fun, interesting um, and get to some Q and A toward the end. So real quick, just a little bit about me. I call myself an accidental advocate because if you had told me in my life before children that I was gonna do anything in women's mental health, I would have laughed at you because that was like the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I went to the Naval Academy for college. And so I was in the military. I was an intelligence officer. I tracked Soviet submarines. Um, I worked at the Pentagon. I worked at the White House. I worked for the United Nations. Like I was large and in charge. I was gonna rule the world. I really thought that I would be the first female Secretary of Defense. I still guess there's still probably an opportunity for that, but it's a little bit further off my radar screen. And then I had this beautiful baby boy. He is the middle of my three children. I have girl, boy, girl. And I had significant postpartum depression after he was born. And during that dark time in my life, I decided that I needed to do something so that other new mothers didn't suffer as I did. And so I first got involved with an organization called Postpartum Support International, um, and I'll talk quite a bit about PSI during the course of this presentation. Um, and then because I am an overachiever, it wasn't good enough to be a volunteer with PSI. I needed to start my own nonprofit in Virginia called Postpartum Support Virginia. And basically we did a lot of the same kinds of things that the larger organization did. Um, and then about five years ago, I had the opportunity to come to Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance to get it off the ground and to really focus on national policy around maternal mental health. So a little bit about me. Uh, I hope that gives you some context. And just, um, just to reiterate, I am not a practitioner. I am not a provider. I am just a mom who had a really hard time and just needed to do something about it. So I've been working as an advocate, a patient advocate and subject matter expert for about 20 years. And so just a couple of words about MMHLA. Sarah did a nice job introducing us. But basically, we focus on three things. We advocate for change. So we are the ones who go to Capitol Hill and we meet with our legislators and our elected officials and say, we need this program. We need this money. Um, we build partnerships like this with other organizations that, that work in this space. And we curate information for the field of maternal mental health. And so at the end, um, there'll be a QR code for you to sign up for our newsletter. We have fact sheets, we do webinars, all that kind of stuff. So we want to be the go-to organization for the field of maternal mental health. Okay, so our goals for today, just so we are all on the same page. Um, the first 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk specifically about maternal mental health and then switch to providing information about policies and programs. And so this is the first time we're diving into all of this. So I'll be really eager to hear about your feedback on the second half of this presentation. Okay, so let's just get started. What are we talking about? Having a baby, the happiest time in a family's life, right? I just pulled these pictures off the internet and just look at how beautiful everything is. Everybody is so calm and quiet. The babies are all sleeping. The houses are beautifully mm. clean. Um, the parents look so happy. I mean, even the colors, the sepia tones of all of these pictures, right? It is all just so beautiful. Isn't this how life was like in your house? Mm. Well, not in mine. It was a little bit more like this. So it is not always the best time in a family's life. Um, in fact, I often say in my house, it was a bit of a shit show. Um, I had a toddler and a newborn. I could barely keep myself together. I mean, the diapers, the 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 the, the everything. Um, and and I actually, this little one on the bottom in the middle in the little blue and white check dress, that is my younger daughter having her two-year-old fit on the ground. I'm guessing nobody else has anything like that. But um, it was it was a bit of a disaster at my house. 
So just to real quick lay out the facts about maternal mental health, we know that mental health conditions are the most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth. We know that these um, impact at least one in five in individuals during pregnancy and the first year postpartum. And we know tragically that suicide and overdose combined are the leading cause of maternal mortality. So if you don't remember anything else about my presentation today, please remember this. Mental health conditions are the most common complications of pregnancy and childbirth, and more mothers die by suicide and overdose combined than any other cause of death. How is this possible in the country that spends more per capita on healthcare than any other country that we are looking at these facts? And of course, we center all of this on maternal mortality, and I'm sure this chart is familiar to many of you, where we see the United States maternal mortality rate not only rising, but being several times higher than any of the other leading industrialized nations. How, again, how is this possible? And then just a quick snapshot as we look at maternal mortality rates by race and ethnicity. And we see the top two lines, non-Hispanic Black women and American Indian and Alaska Native. I mean, just look at the disparities. Again, we just, how is this possible and what can we do about it? That's what drives all of our work. And as I said earlier, and this is a chart directly from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention showing the most frequent underlying cause of pregnancy-related deaths. And we see mental health conditions by far and large, the leading, overlap, the leading cause of pregnancy-related deaths. And I do just wanna point out that when you disaggregate this data, by race and ethnicity, we see that these mental health conditions are the leading cause of death for white and Hispanic women, but they are the most populous women in our country. And so that's what drives this. And that the leading cause of death for black women is cardiac and coronary conditions and for Asian women is hemorrhage. It's just the numbers there, particularly around Asian women are much, much smaller. Okay, so when we talk about maternal mental health conditions, what are we talking about? So it's the two year perinatal time frame. So from conception, basically through a full year following the end of pregnancy, um, and encompasses a wide range of disorders. We used to just talk about postpartum depression. We now talk about so much more. We know very, very often it's anxiety and not depression. There's also bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, of course, substance use disorder, and in rare cases, psychosis. And so what we're really talking about is that it's not just postpartum and it's not just depression. It often starts during pregnancy and it can be a wide range of issues. And so you may have heard a variety of different terms. Again, what we used to call postpartum depression. Sometimes we say perinatal to encompass that two-year perinatal time frame. sometimes antenatal if it's during pregnancy, uh, perinatal mood disorders, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, a whole bunch of different terms. I will be using maternal mental health conditions as, as my um, overarching term uh, during the course of this presentation. So we know that these illnesses are very complex, as are most mental health issues. It's never just one thing. It's often a combination of biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. And so we often talk about um, women who have like a complicated reproductive history, did they have uh, PMS when they were a teenager? Did they have trouble getting pregnant? Did they have trouble staying pregnant? Is there, is there some underlying you know, um, physical uh, causes that you know, may lead to this? Um, certain people have kinds of personalities and behaviors. For example, I'm a little bit type A. I like to have things sort of neat, neat, neat and orderly and you know, having uh, a baby kind of blows that all out of the water. And of course, there's social factors like the pandemic or trauma. We also know that the childbearing years uh, often overlay the years of many social changes with changes in jobs, changes in housing. Um, and so it's often a combination of all of these different factors. What we do know is that these conditions often start earlier and last longer than we think. So there was a study done in 2012 that shows that of people who experience maternal mental health conditions in the postpartum period, about a third enter pregnancy with underlying conditions, another third develop those symptoms during pregnancy, and then the final 40% or so develop symptoms following childbirth. We also know that if untreated, 
that these conditions can last a lot longer. So a study from 2019 showed that 25% of those who experienced maternal mental health conditions still had depressive symptoms at three years postpartum. So they're the women who then come back into pregnancy with those underlying conditions. We also know from recent studies that the peak onset of maternal mental health conditions is three to six months postpartum, and that the peak incidence of suicide is six to nine months postpartum. And that's why we've been advocating really hard the last couple of years as this information has become available to ensure that pregnant and postpartum people are being screened and provided information during pregnancy all the way through that first year postpartum. Um, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics currently recommends screening up to six months, but because of the information that we've learned, we're really encouraging them to continue to screen all the way through that first year postpartum. We also know that black women and birthing people are disproportionately impacted by these illnesses. They are twice as likely to experience these conditions, but much less likely to get treatment. For all of the reasons that we know, those of us who work in maternal mortality, we know the social determinants of health, bias and racism in the healthcare system, chronic stress that leads to weathering and premature aging of their bodies, um, and logistical barriers such as time off from work, transportation, and child care. So a whole host of reasons why Black women experience these illnesses at greater rates and are less likely to get help. And so who's at risk? Well, not only individuals of color, as well as people with a history of mental health conditions, but people who have experienced trauma, those who lack social support, especially from their partner, um, individuals who live in poverty in low-income neighborhoods, parents with a baby in the NICU, we know that military mothers and military spouses, as well as veteran women, are at increased risk, as well as immigrant parents. So when I look at this list, I almost scratch my head and say, okay, who's not on the list? That's why, again, we have been advocating so much for um, universal education and screening around these illnesses. All right, so why do we care? What's the big deal? Well, women with untreated maternal mental health conditions are more likely to not manage their own health, particularly during pregnancy. They may not attend their prenatal visits. They may have poor nutrition and they may use substances such as alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. We also know that these women are at greater risk for experiencing physical or emotional or sexual abuse themselves. And then in the postpartum period, moms with untreated mental health conditions are likely to be less responsive to their baby's cues maybe not have as many positive interactions with their baby, um, experience breastfeeding challenges, and question their own confidence as mothers. Over and over again, I have heard women who experience postpartum depression or anxiety say, I am the worst mother in the world. My family would be better off without me when those things are the furthest thing from the truth. We also know that children born to mothers with untreated maternal mental health conditions are at increased risk for poor birth outcomes, like low birth weight, small head size, preterm birth, and longer stays in the NICU. We also know that these babies are more likely to experience excessive crying because if their mother's not responding to them, they cry more, it scares the mother more, it becomes this terrible negative feedback loop. And this can lead to impaired parent-child interactions, which can have long-term negative impact on the child increasing the risk for behavioral, cognitive, and emotional delays. And we know from a landmark study in 1998 that untreated mental health conditions in the home can lead to an adverse childhood experience. And so you can see for a whole variety of reasons why we want mom and, and dad and their mental health to be 100%. What, is the other impact, what are the other impacts of untreated maternal mental health conditions? Well, there's a direct impact on the partner we know that maternal depression is the number one predictor of paternal depression. So how the mother does also impacts how the father or the other parent in the home does. We know that one in 10 dads will experience anxiety or depression, but that they manifest with symptoms that are more along the lines of anger and frustration and, and often stern discipline at other children in the household. We know that non-birthing parents are also impacted. So adoptive parents, foster parents, same-sex parents, um, and again, how the mother does really impacts the entire family. We also know that parents who are anxious or depressed are more likely to overuse the healthcare system. These are the parents who may call the OB's office or call the pediatrician's office, and you're scratching your head and like, I just talked to you yesterday. Why are you calling again? 
These are the parents who may show up in the emergency room uh, repeatedly, you know, thinking that something is wrong with the baby when really it's something is wrong with, with how they're doing. Um, these parents are also less likely to adhere to safety guidelines for safe infant sleep and for car seat usage. And of course, there are specific costs of these conditions. So there are the untold costs, the impacts on relationships with a partner and other children. I know, for example, I experienced a lot of postpartum rage and it was all targeted at my husband. It took a real toll on our relationship. And we also know that some of these families decide not to have any other children and there is no price that we could put on that. There are, however, some societal costs. There was a study done in 2019 that tried to calculate this and it came up to be a total of $32,000 per parent-child dyad or $14 billion each year in our country. And that's addressing those poor birth and health outcomes that I talked about earlier, as well as lost wages and productivity of the parents. We also know that the vast majority of women who experience symptoms go untreated. Um, and so uh, um, they come up with this expression, the perinatal depression cascade. So it starts with you know, perhaps the perinatal depression wasn't even recognized, right? Person wasn't screened. Um, if they are screened, they may not start treatment. If they do start treatment, oftentimes it's inadequate. They don't get treated to symptom remission. And so again, we have 75% of those who experience these illnesses never really fully recover. So it's the perfect storm, right? Huge hormonal changes, major sleep deprivation. It's the single biggest identity transition for most parents. A lot of times there's those unrealistic expect expectations. Like if you go back to my very first slide with all of those beautiful families, you know, people are on social media. And of course, nobody's ever, you know, as, as good as they look on social media. There may be challenges that the parents faced either during pregnancy or during labor and delivery. Any predisposition for depression or anxiety can sort of, you know, be re-triggered during this time frame, And that lack of access to healthcare. So, I know I've been going down, down, down. Let's come up a little bit. Let's talk about the good news. We know that maternal mental health conditions are often temporary and treatable. We know that pregnant and postpartum people are actively engaged in the healthcare system. We don't have to go and find them. We know where they are. They come to the obstet obstetrician's office. They come to the pediatrician's office. There's ample opportunity to engage with them. There are evidence-based prevention and treatment options. We know that parents, families, and babies can all recover. And more and more, there's resources for both providers and parents. So there is a lot of good news here. I wanna point out um, sort of the steps to wellness, the recovery path for most people includes some combination of self-care, social support, therapy, and medication. And this can be in person, this can be online. There's all kinds of digital platforms that are providing these different kinds of things. Um, we actually have a fact sheet on the steps to wellness. Um, and we encourage you to go ahead and download that and learn more about that. Um, but again, these illnesses are temporary, very often temporary and treatable. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually prevent postpartum depression or other mental health issues related to pregnancy and postpartum? So there are three evidence-based prevention programs. I have them listed here with their links. Um, and each one of them has been proven successful in actually preventing postpartum depression with very short, very targeted interventions, typically delivered in the late uh, pregnancy in the third trimester, and then a few booster sessions after baby arrives. Um, but they incorporate things like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mindfulness, baby care skills, interpersonal therapy. Um, and so we're gonna be doing a lot of work over this year to uplift these different prevention programs, because again, Right, as we all know, prevention is worth whatever it is that little saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears now and talk about policies and programs. And I'm gonna talk about some organizations. I'm gonna talk about a lot of work that's happening at the federal government level. And um, from this point forward, I'm gonna have links and calls to action. And again, you'll get all of these slides. So you'll have these specific links, um, but lots of resources coming up in this section. Okay, so most of you, I'm guessing, are familiar with the White House blueprint for addressing maternal health crisis in our country. That is why uh, many of you received funding because uh, there was this call to action 
for a whole of government strategy to make the US the best country in the world to have a baby. Um, and I just wanted to point out that in this blueprint, there are some specific call outs around maternal mental health. And I'll actually be talking about some of these like National Maternal Mental Health Task Force and the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline. And so I just wanted to like, just sort of start with, you know, we're gonna start big, we're gonna start at the White House. Okay. Um, and again, as I go through this, some of this may be information that you already know, but I wanted to get it all on the table. So there are many organizations addressing the maternal mortality crisis, starting with our state maternal mortality review committees. Um, and these are state-based multidisciplinary committees um, that determine the underlying cause of maternal deaths. And um, so these, these um, committees have access to a whole bunch of records, not just death records and death certificates, but they can access health records, police reports, social services reports. Um, they interview families. The, the goal is to really understand why women are dying. And these are the organizations that have um, collectively shown that mental health issues are the leading cause of death. So then information from the maternal mortality review committees influence another statewide organization called the Perinatal Quality Collaboratives. And I'm guessing that many of you may already be involved with the state PQCs. These are state or regional networks of teams and they're focused to, to improve the quality of care for mothers and babies. So these are QI programs, um, most often focused on hospitals and hospital systems. And so one of the things that they implement are AIM safety bundles. Um, the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health puts out these bundles around particular topics with the goal of making birth safer and improving outcomes. Um, and in particular, I wanted to list that there's about 10 safety bundles and there's two in particular, two new ones, one on perinatal mental health and one on substance use disorder. And so perhaps this is something that you would consider as you do your work, maybe implementing these AIM safety bundles. Okay, so now looking at some other federal programs, the IMPROVE initiative was launched in 2019, and this is through the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I'm not gonna say that again, because there's so many words, um, but the whole focus of this IMPROVE initiative is supporting research to reduce maternal mortality with a focus on mental health disparities. They've had a series of maternal health challenges, um, and one of the big things that they did was um, uh, put out an RFP and launch centers of excellence. Again, these are focused primarily on research. Um, there's the link. I've highlighted the states that actually won these awards. And so primarily these are research institutes, universities within those states. And again, moving forward from here, I've got links for everything. Um, and again, all of this will be made available to you. Okay, HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, put out a lot of funding in 2023 in particular. There was an announcement that included funding for all of these different programs. So the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, AIM, which I already mentioned, um, is now in 49 states and over 2,000 hospitals. Um, they also launched sort of a, a subset of this, uh, the Community Care Initiative that focused on um, community organization, so that's in 11 sites. Um, the Maternal Health and Substance Use Disorder Program, this is the one that, that MMHLA in particular ad advocates for. Grants have been made to 12 states. Um, there's other programs for like the Healthy Star Program, the Home Visiting Program. Again, a lot of money coming out of HRSA to address maternal mortality. A word or two about the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline. I consider this like my fourth child. When I came to this job five years ago, I was like, why don't we have a 24 hour number for moms and dads to call if they're in distress? And so we advocated for some funding and now it's in legislation. Um, there's the phone number. It was launched on Mother's Day, 2022. Over 25,000 people have been helped thus far, uh, both um, by call, by voice and by text. And again, there's the link. And I am gonna share some awesome resources for um, I encourage you to take action, um, distribute their cards and flyers. Again, there's the link. They've got all kinds of great information. I uh, wanna get this word out to as many moms, dads as possible. Okay, the National Maternal Mental Health Task Force was also implemented 
by legislation. Um, it is the goal is to create a national strategy for the federal government around maternal mental health. I'm actually on the task force. Um, and then to provide some guidance to governors so that states also are taking actions. Um, and we're looking at four specific things, prevention, screening, and diagnosis, of course, intervention and treatment, community practices, and communications and engagement. And this is being run through SAMHSA. And uh, your, your action item for this is to provide public comment to um, the report or what the, what the task force is putting out so far. Um, there's the link. They're looking for a public comment by January 31st. And basically there's like three or four questions under each one of these topics to answer. So I do encourage you to reach out and, and take action there. The federal government is also really focusing on awareness and information. So the uh, Department of Health and Human Services launched a new campaign called Talking Postpartum Depression. And um, it includes lots of stories of women with lived experience, um, both uh, there's videos, there's um, uh, uh, stories that you can download. It's really an excellent, excellent campaign. I wish it was wider than just postpartum depression, but hey, we'll take whatever we can get. And the National Institute of Mental Health just updated their perinatal depression brochure. I was just looking at it yesterday. It's absolutely beautiful. All the up-to-date information, it includes like information about the maternal mental health hotline, um, and so you can download it at that link. And again, your action item is to share these resources. All right, psychiatry access programs are another program at the state level that are addressing maternal mental health. So um, the goal of these programs is to address the shortage of psychiatric providers. We know there's never gonna be enough psychiatric providers for women who are experiencing mental health conditions during and following pregnancy. And so what these programs do, they basically have like four key components. First of all, they go out and train frontline providers. So whether it's obstetricians or psychiatrists, pediatricians, whoever is interacting with pregnant and postpartum people, they'll train those providers about these illnesses as well as how to set up screening and treatment programs. They also offer real-time psychiatric consultation. So for example, if I'm an OB and a woman comes in and she has symptoms and I don't know how to treat them, I can call and talk to a psychiatrist in real time and they'll help me figure out what the best course of treatment is. They also will then connect that mom with resources and referrals. And these programs also provide technical assistance. So they'll actually like come into your practice or come into your program and help you set up the screening and treatment program. And so the first one of these programs started in Massachusetts about 10 years ago. Um, the chart on the right shows all of the different states that now um, have some version of a psychiatry access program. 12 of those states are currently funded by the federal government. And so then there will be your link to learn more about these programs. And I do really encourage you to connect with these programs in your state. They are an incredible, valuable resource in addressing maternal mental health. Many states also have intensive treatment programs. Again, we don't have nearly enough. Um, these maps, again, just show you where these programs are. So uh, in, terms, in terms of inpatient programs, there really are only four dedicated um, inpatient programs specifically for women. And there's only one that is just focused on perinatal mental health. And that's at the University of North Carolina um, where there is just so much activity going on around maternal mortality and women's mental health. And then many states have outpatient programs. And again, here's a link on our website where you can learn about these. And super important to know so that you know where to refer women who are in real crisis. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot here and uh, talk about some organizations that are active in this space. And of course, I have to start with our very own Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. So as I mentioned earlier, we do three things. We advocate for change, we build partnerships, and we curate information for the field. So we really take the lead on federal policy. Um, and in fact, we're getting set to do our annual Advocacy Day, which is a virtual event where we bring advocates, experts in the field, um, people like you and me, to meet with our elected officials and their staffs to talk about maternal mental health and to continue to ask for funding for our programs. So um, at the end, we'll have a link to our website and encourage any of you who are interested in learning more about advocacy to join us um, for that event. We'll also be doing some advocacy trainings this year. We want to help as many people feel comfortable with advocating for their programs as possible. Can we build partnerships? We convene leaders to focus on solutions 
We've been working on a multi-year project called a screening project to ensure that all pregnant and postpartum people are not only educated about, but screened for these illnesses and get connected with health. And as I mentioned earlier, we curate information for the field. We're very proud of our newsletter and our fact sheets. We host webinars. We have a website with a big resource hub. So I encourage all of you to check out MMHLA's website, sign up for our newsletter, and also join us in Advocacy Day if you can. So we work with a, a two other leading organizations in the field. The first is Postpartum Support International. You might have heard me mention earlier that this is where I got my start as a volunteer. So PSI, um, nicknamed PSI, um, uh, started with like really two strong focuses. So support to moms and families. They have a warm line. Um, they have volunteer coordinators in all 50 states. They have online provider directory, they run support groups, so really supporting moms and families during this important time in life. And they also do a lot of training for providers. They have a free introductory webinar, there's like an eight hour webinar series, they do in-person and virtual trainings, and they have an annual conference every year. This year it's gonna be in July. I highly encourage you, if you wanna learn more about maternal mental health, this is the conference to attend. Um, they also have state chapters in almost every state um, in various, manifestations. Uh, a few states already had standalone nonprofit organizations like I launched Postpartum Support Virginia. So now that's one of their state chapters. Some of them are just getting off the ground and need help. So again, if you're interested in learning more, please connect with your state chapters. And finally, they dip a toe in policy. Um, they run an initiative called Mind the Gap, which is a monthly coalition that meets and we discuss all things relative to maternal health um, at the yeah, that involves policy. Um, and they are working specifically on policy in three states this year in New Jersey, Ohio, and Kentucky. And so again, please connect with PSI, Mind the Gap, and your state's PSI chapter. And then the third organization that really focuses on mental maternal mental health at the national level is the Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health. Um, they are located in California mostly, and their goal is to close gaps in maternal mental health care. You might have seen last year, they came out with the state report cards that assessed the level of maternal mental health in each state. They also do a policy fellows program. So they take in, um, you know, uh, they focus on different states, bring those uh, leaders from those states together to really focus on policy at the state level. They do awesome briefings and reports. They have an annual forum coming up. March 19th through 20th. Um, and again, just another opportunity if you wanna do a deeper dive in maternal mental health. And they really, really have taken a lead on focusing on state policy. And so um, they have a whole web page dedicated to policy at the state level. Um, these are all the different states that I've, I've highlighted that have some kind of legislation around maternal mental health, whether it's establishing a coalition or a task force, doing an awareness campaign, uh, requiring screening or education for frontline providers. And so again, um, encourage you to check out, check out your state's policies at uh, the maternal, I'm sorry, the ah, Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health. They used to be called 2020 Mom and I just caught a glimpse of that and so threw me off a little bit. Okay, so I know that's a lot, we're almost done. I want to provide a couple of resources, um, things for you to consider as you go about this work. So something that we have found to be really, really, really helpful for parents is creating a postpartum plan, right? We've all heard about the birth plan, what the parents would desire the birthing experience to be. The problem is that the baby doesn't often get the birth plan. And so sometimes the birth plan doesn't go according to plan. And we have actually found that, you know, for women who may be a little bit anxious, um, when the birth plan doesn't go according to the plan, it, it can really be a trigger. And so what we encourage is actually focusing on the postpartum time frame. And the idea with these postpartum plans is to engage parents in a conversation about what are we going to do about sleep, about infant feeding, what about visitors, you know, how are we going to feed ourselves, who's going to take care of the other children, all of those kinds of things. Um, and there's some links to some... Um, organizations that have written postpartum plans. I just checked those. They all work. I was just looking at them this week. But you can also just Google postpartum plan. There's a ton on Pinterest. And again, there's none of them. I, I mean, they're all great. But the, again, the whole idea is just to start thinking about what it is going to be like to come home with a baby and who's going to take care of all of these things. 
I also want to give you a list of places where you can find some excellent print materials. Um, some of them are free, some of them are low cost. But again, lots of organizations have put together print materials, and so you don't need to start fresh. Um, there's excellent or uh, places to find them, and we actually have a link on our website to all of these. Okay, so we are just about done. I'm going to talk real quick about some next steps. Here is a QR code. I would love for you to take out your phone and scan it and go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. Um, we don't send more than two newsletters a month, so don't worry, you're not gonna, your, your inbox will not be flooded. Please check out our website, especially our resource hub, lots of good information, all geared toward how we can all work together to improve the maternal mental health of our nation's mothers and um, birthing people. And again, join us for Advocacy Day if you're interested in getting more involved in this effort. That's on March 13th. Our website just went live today with registration. So um, it's right on our homepage. And that is that. Thank you again for being with us today. I am going to stop sharing and engage hopefully in some Q&A with all of you. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was fantastic. And an incredible amount of work obviously went into that. And um, uh, someone said the QR code isn't working. Oh, you're kidding me. So we can just put the link in the chat. That would yeah, be yeah. fun. So, yeah. Um, I'll ask her. Yeah. So Mara Child, who is also from MMHLA, is also mm -hmm. on, the, on the line. There she it is. She's our, it, it worked, worked for, for me. It worked for you? Yeah. Oh, good. But no, I, others are I saying it works. Signed up, so. <laughs> Yay. All right. So it is working. All right. But we'll also drop the link in the chat. So <laughs> yeah. anyway. More is the better. Um, and if there are questions in the chat, I might have missed them because I got kicked out not once, but twice. Oh, great. Internet con connectivity problems. Um, but I want to invite people to go ahead and uh, raise their, you know, Unmute their phones, raise their hand if you have questions. Someone just asked, is Advocacy Day virtual? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Of course. I'm sorry. I should have said that from the get-go. Yes. Virtual Advocacy Day. Yes. 100%. Yep. Yep. You mentioned that PSI has warm light. Oh, great question. What's a warm light? Okay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. So um, they use the term warm line or help line. And that's basically where somebody could call in and leave a message and somebody will call you back. So that's like what I used to do when I was a PSI volunteer. I was their Virginia volunteer. So if a mom or dad called in from Virginia, left the message, they would pass that information to me and I would call back. Um, so that as, as opposed to a hotline, which is we have that national maternal mental hotline, that's a live line 24-7. You can call or text and get immediately connected with a live person. So that's the difference between a hotline and a warm line. Great question. Um, someone asked, can you share a little more about what Advocacy Day looks like? And Mara put a link to that in the... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad that you're asking about that. So Advocacy Day is basically where we bring together people into little teams of like four or five people. And you will meet with either your elected official, your congressman or your senator, or more likely their staff. And we just set up these meetings as an opportunity for people like us, advocates, to talk about why mental health is important. Um, and we'll give you specific asks. We are continuing to ask for funding for the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline and for those grants to states, as well as a new military initiative um, to focus on preventing postpartum depression. And so we coach you through it. We put you in teams, we assign you a leader, um, often with an experienced advocate like me or like Mara. And it's really an incredible opportunity to democracy in action, right? We are talking to our elected officials, telling them what programs and policies we want them to, to lead into. Yeah, it is a full day commitment though, because uh, we do like a little training that morning. And then there'll be like a series of meetings, like maybe three or four meetings over the course of the afternoon. So we do ask you to block the whole day. You can be like on your computer doing other things, but we do ask that you, um, you know, commit to the whole day. Other questions that may be out there. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Yeah, I want to ask a question of all of you. Good. So, yeah, and this can just be, you know, like do the little hand raise thing. So how many of you... 
Um, is this your first um, introduction to maternal mental health, like in a sort of like in a concentrated way? Just a little show of hands on your, your little hand thing. Okay, Joan, I see. Oh my gosh, we've got so we got four pages of people and a couple of people have raised their hand. Okay, so I'd love to see then how many of you um like think as you, you know, I, I'm I'm wondering after this, like if you're thinking that this could be something that you'd like to lean in at the state level. Um, because we can certainly help connect you with folks in your states who are doing this maternal mental health work if that is something that you're interested in. And again, you can reach out to us afterwards if if that is something. Love to be able to do this at a higher level. Right. So if you're interested in learning more, like you really want to learn lean into this, I highly encourage you to um, connect with Postpartum Support International, either do their online training or come to their conference. That is where you're going to learn all about maternal mental health. They actually do a two-day program, which um, they will do virtually for you or in person. And it's really like all of the things that I talked about, but deeper dives around each one of these things. And so if this is something that you or your organization really wants to learn more about, PSI is definitely the place for training. Um, if you want to learn more about advocacy, that's our organization. And so, you know, Advocacy Day, we're going to do some advocacy webinars in April to, so if you can't participate in Advocacy Day, we'll do some webinars that will teach you, like, how do you write a good op-ed about this? How do you ask for a governor's proclamation to declare May Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you can't commit to a whole day, there are these some one-off opportunities that we'll be highlighting as well. And those folks who, if you've got your hand up, um, would love for you to connect with, uh, I hope, Mari, you're writing those down. We'd love to follow up with you if there's more information that we can help um, as you think about how you're going to address this at your state level. And uh, if any of you have questions, uh, come off mute. It's hard to tell if someone's raising their hand to ask or <laughs> yeah. trying to make the connection. I just wanted to put in a plug here, too. When you, you listed all the HRSA funded programs last year. You did not have the maternal health innovation. Well, because you guys already know about it. Oh, I know. I know. Not them. I mean, because a lot of the people on this are not. And oh, okay. So, uh, so, so yeah, I thought I, just, I knew that that's why you did it. But I just wanted to throw that in there that uh, the maternal health innovation programs are very much interested in uh, maternal mental health and um, certainly substance abuse disorders and and we are working ways both here at MHLIC and also with our MHIs um, to uplift that issue and share uh, best practices. So I'm not putting you on the spot. No, no, no. Thanks, Janet. So I just assumed that everybody on this call knew about those programs. No, so, no, no. It's uh, I learned. I'm always learning about stuff. So well, do you want to talk for a minute about the innovation programs? I mean, I think. You know, most people probably know there are MHIs on here, but the purpose is these are HRSA funded programs to support innovations uh, in maternal health that are based on, a lot of it's based around the requirement that the MHIs facilitate a statewide mm -hmm. task force on mm -hmm. maternal health. And of course, many of the issues that arise both through the data and just the the, the people on the task force in that mental health is a critical, critical need. And um, so we're making efforts here at the center to uh, curate resources. So I'm very excited to look at what you have. And um, so MHLICs are great partners to everyone who is involved in this kind of work. Right, right. Thank you. I just assumed everybody knew about the state no, innovation I program. So that's no, awesome. I'm not putting it on the spot. That's a it's an it's a natural uh, bit of misinformation on my part, or, di or uh, whatever the word is, lack yeah. of information on my part. Um, so I some, see a few people who have their hands up. Anna and Denise and Lindsay, did you have a specific question, or was your hand still raised from um, wanting to learn more? Anna still raised. Yes, Anna, go. <clears throat> It was, it was still raised from the tally earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay. so, but Anna, I saw you're with Nurse Family Partnership. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so um, my name is Anna Sloan. I am the advocacy coordinator at the National Service Office for Nurse Family Partnership and Child First. Um, so we are two home visiting programs, a Nurse Family Partnership pairs first-time low-income mothers with a nurse who will come from the first trimester of pregnancy all the way through the second year of the child's life. And Child First is intensive um, in-home intergenerational uh, mental health and trauma treatment for parents and caregivers. Um, so nurse, nurse Family Partnership especially, um, you know, we focus on a lot of the same issues that you all have talked about today, such as screenings and you know, substance abuse prevention and treatment. Um, so always looking to learn more about the specific, you know, areas that are changing policy wise, and then also what we can do to, you know, better help connect our our clients with those resources. Awesome. And I saw somebody dropped in a chat that they work with Family Connect, which is another home visiting program. All right. Oh, come on, there must be some pressing, some things you're just dying to ask. <laughs> Here's your chance. Oh, good. Um, Massachusetts, right, is Mind the Gap Coalition is meeting. That's great. All right, so I have a question to ask all of you. If you, you know, uh, either saw, you know, you know a new mom and you might ask her how she's doing, or in your job, if you screen a new mom using the Edinburgh or even just, you know, asking how's your mental health, if they expressed a need for help, what would you do? Do you, would you know where to send them? Do you know where to send them? And I can, you know, give you a couple of places. So of course you could refer them to the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline, which is great. Um, you could refer them to Postpartum Support International or their local PSI chapter. Um, those are great places for them to get connected. PSI, as I said, runs support groups, has a national directory of providers. Um, and so we all have a resource for moms who are in need. So either the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline or Postpartum Support International are absolutely two places that you can refer anybody. All the services are free of charge. PSI does not charge for any of their services to new moms. Mention a special screening for service members. Are there any screenings or supports in the work for military service? Oh, oh my goodness, Anna, we're gonna pull you in. We are doing a whole lot of work this year focusing on the military. Um, we know we did actually we did a fact sheet in a webinar in the fall about uh, maternal mental health among military members. We know for so many reasons that. Um, either active duty or spouses of active duty are at increased risk for experiencing mental health challenges for just so many reasons. Like, for example, one of our staff members was at a Walgreens pharmacy the other day, and she saw a mom in uniform with an infant and, you know, standing in line, the baby's all fussy. And so, you know, our, my, our staff member, Suzanne, started chatting with her. And it turns out, you know, this mom is here in the Washington, D.C. area with her, her infant, um, her partner is also active duty military and he lives in a different state. And so this mom is basically solo parenting. She um, has a job that requires her to go in person because of her security clearances. She cannot work from home. So he, she has the sick infant with an ear infection who can't go back to daycare. And she's, you know, a single mom here, basically um, doesn't know how she's going to juggle all of this you know, paying an arm and a leg for child care that her child can't go to because child is sick. Um, and, you know, not near the family of origin, so they don't have built-in social support. Um, you know, and we think about, um, imagine if her partner was deployed and being worried that that partner might be in harm's way. You know, frequent moves. So just by the time you get your social circle set up, it's time to move again. Um, and so I see Emerald nodding her head. You know, there's lots of reasons that our military families are disproportionately impacted by these illnesses. So we're going to be leaning in there quite a bit this year. So anybody who wants to join us in this effort, just reach out to us and let us know. Um, we're introducing, in fact, legislation was introduced just yesterday. We're so excited about a pilot project um, focused on those prevention programs. You might remember I listed three 
evidence-based prevention programs. What we're trying to do is get those implemented in the military in a pilot project to prove that they can be helpful in the military, right, and then get more funding behind that. So yes, Anna, thank you for putting the little celebration up in Emerald for you know nodding in agreement. We really, really want to do more to support our, our nation's military mothers. And there's a question about whether you're working with ACOG or... Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And we all know that ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, in the fall, no, I'm sorry, was it last year? Anyway, they came out with new guidance for their members about screening and treating these illnesses. Um, two new updates that they worked on for years to get it right you know, not only how to identify and screen, but how to treat these conditions with specific medications and dosages and whatnot. Um, yes, so ACOG is all over this. The American Academy of Family Physicians as well um, has been leaning into this. And we've worked with them and many, many other organizations on this multi-year project that I referenced called the Screening Project, uh, making sure that all of these organizations have the latest information about when to screen, what tools to use, and most importantly, how to get moms connected with the help that they need. Um, oh, so, yeah, so a uh, few goals of the screening project. So the first year, so we started this, gosh, I think in 2022, 2021, the first year we brought all these organizations and people together to identify a timeline for when to screen. There were all these different screening recommendations about you know, screen postpartum, screen here, screen there. So we came up with this cadence, this timeline, on when to screen, starting with prenatal care, going all the way through the first year postpartum. And of course, uh, you know, we had many focus groups. We, you know, brought together hundreds of people to get input on this. And everybody said, oh, this is great. This is fabulous. But there's too many barriers. Like, how do I get reimbursed? How, where do I send people who need help? The screening tools are old and out of date. So now we're working at chipping away at each one of these. And again, Emerald's nodding. I love it when people are like, yes, with me here. It's like being in person. Um, uh, so now we're chipping away at these different barriers to, to screening. So for example, we heard over and over again that frontline providers uh, may not be educated. So we are embarking on a huge undertaking this year to go out to a bunch of different conferences, we have this giant spreadsheet of like 100 different conferences that we're trying to send people to talk at. Um, so if any of you, you know, are connected with organizations um, where you want a speaker um, or, you know, you're, you're putting on a conference and you want somebody to come and talk about it, let us know. We're, um, as far as like the screening tools, we found an organization, some researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University that have taken the EPDS, which is the standard screening tool, made some minor modifications to bring it up to date and make it more current. And they're testing that out. So if you wanna get involved with that, let us know. Um, lots of things, lots of stuff going on. Mary Lou, good to see you coming onto the camera. Did you wanna uh, say anything? Nope, not putting you on the spot. Just, you know, saw that friendly face. We're, we're coming up, we got five minutes left uh, here about the EPS. It certainly had some limitations in its current state, yeah. So with each one of these, so we identified these four barriers to, to screening and we're working on short-term and long-term goals. So for the screening in particular, the short-term goal is this EPDS US as they're calling it. Um, and then long-term, there's a team of researchers who are like starting from scratch and you know coming up with a screening tool that's more robust to screens for more than just anxiety and depression, you know, is uh, validated both during pregnancy and in the postpartum period, um, has up-to-date language. Um, yeah, so hopefully coming up with, you know, a brand new validated screening tool in the next couple of years. Yes, not trauma, absolutely. Right, right, right. Yep. Yep, so the presentation will be, I'm not sure, are they going to be emailed or posted on the website? Um, the... Um, the presentation will be on our website and I'll also mail a link to you when that's available. Um, and I will mail the slides out right after this. Awesome. Yep. Yep. And I'm just going through the chat. I see something from Rachel, right? Emphasize how to establish trust. Absolutely. We know that, um, groups who have been impacted by systemic racism, uh, women of color, um, uh, Native American, indigenous women, we know, for example, they're very fearful about acknowledging if they have a mental health concern for fear of their child being removed from their care, 
Um, and so it is a real, real concern. And so we, you know, we have a lot of work to do around educating people to understand what is sort of a normal maternal mental health condition and when it is crossing over into a situation where it's a crisis. Yes, absolutely. We recognize that this is a big problem. Awesome, awesome. I'm excited to see so much networking going on yeah. in the chat and, and glad that there is a, there's gonna be lots of activity coming out of that. Um, we I, are- Yeah, I wanna just respond to one. Somebody put in there, are you also working with A1? Absolutely. In fact, Mar and I were just in Atlanta this past weekend working with their leadership team. We got a, a, like a formal partnership in place. We're gonna be hopefully, um, uh, helping present at different state conferences, at um, different sections. Uh, we'll be at AWAN's big convention in Phoenix. So hopefully, Tracy, we'll see you there. All okay. Right. So we're at our end. And I, once again, I really want to thank Adrian and uh, Mara for this terrific work. And so excited that we have this recording and that we'll have these slides because there's just so much information and I appreciate you putting links on the slides. So I'll get those out to you right after this so you can immediately jump into them. Awesome. Well, thank Thanks you all for so being much. with us. So grateful for taking time from your busy day and um, really enjoyed talking with you today and look forward to connecting with some of you um, in a more formal way. Thank you all so much.